And the fit application, which I'm going to show, is also joint work with payout and uh, lids as well. Um, okay, and so the first thing I need to do is unpack a little bit about interpretivism. I'm going to assume that most of you are roughly familiar with some idea of qua work. Yes, if you're not, this would be a good time to like say, what is qua work? <laughs> no, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> uh, so uh, what I want to do is kind of qualitative work is usually uh, imply some level of textual or spoken discourse analysis. Uh, it might be interviews, it might be field research, it might be uh, forums. Um, I prefer to talk about it in terms of not qual quant because that's really kinds of data. But in terms of the analysis, interpretivism versus empiricism. So empiricism is roughly hypothesis testing. And uh, interpretivism assumes that the observer or the participant observer uh, is in fact interpreting uh, the, their surroundings. And part of the analysis is actually to kind of use yourself as an instrument. It is empirical. Uh, it is a field-based tradition, um, but it's not hypothesis testing, per se. Uh, there's a whole set of analytical techniques that are involved, and I can go through that, uh, along with some data collection methods, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it's, uh, interpretivism is very wrapped around the theory. Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later, but a lot of times people talk about this as theory method packages rather than there's a method over here and a theory over here, and you can kind of combine them in any way you want. Uh, it's best used uh, when the context is very important, um, particularly when uh, maybe the technology is new or the phenomenon's not very well understood. Um, the reason that I like it a lot and I've used it a lot is uh, I find this incredibly useful for design. I need to actually go in and understand what people are trying to do and what their mindset is and how they think about the world before I can design for them. And I at least find that that's best done through some level of field-based work rather than uh, something like surveys or lab experiments. Um, I I'm going to also add that, um, to what I mentioned earlier, this is uh, largely an autobiographical romp through some theoretical literatures. I'm not going to claim to be inclusive of everything. Um, some of Sylvia's work is not going to be present for a variety of reasons you'll see later. Uh, but I at least want to kind of work through a set of theoretical concerns and show why they're important for things like design. Did that answer your question about qual? Okay, good. <laughs> all of a sudden I was in the middle of an oral exam. Um, okay, I think I've mentioned all this, but um, I think for the last maybe five years, there's there's been a, I don't want to say a, a, an assumption, there's been kind of this kind of low rumbling that maybe a lot of CSCW uh, field-based research has kind of tapped out. Um, we find it kind of charming when we find another awareness study. We find it a little charming when we, we look at um, some older issues, like I just saw another group editing paper, I was all excited. Um, uh, but, um, you know, there's some sense that maybe it's gone stale, and I think that this is actually a signal that it's time to do new things. Uh, one of the things that has happened is there's lots of confusion in the review process at this point about new stuff when it shows up, and what I want to do here is not say, oh, this stuff has never been explored before, but rather to try to provide some framework for understanding what changes are going on in interpretivist research inside CSCW, and kind of point out where some of the things are going. Okay, so that was the first reason. The second reason was actually just more practical. My, I and my group got kind of stuck. So uh, we've been looking at a range of issues in knowledge reuse and expertise sharing and pervasive artifacts like memory. I'm gonna use HALT here. Uh, it's got the same problems as the others, but it's a little bit easier to explain. So we started off with a study that Liz and uh, Tiffany Bonneau and I did in Flint, Michigan. I assume everybody here is kind of roughly familiar with Flint. Okay, these are, I don't know how well you can see this, but these are beautiful houses that have been boarded up because Flint is depopulating like crazy. Um, 
the automobile industry is basically pulled out. There's not a lot of industrial base or for that matter, commercial base left in Flint. Uh, the inner city of Flint has a poverty rate of about 38%. It's one of the highest crime areas in the United States. Um, and it has a lot of people with diabetes, high blood pressure, and kidney disease. Uh, Liz interviewed uh, these people and also some diabetes educators to try to get a sense of what it meant to have a chronic disease in a low resource area. Um, and what she found, of course, was that uh, having these diseases highly bound up in, and contextualized by the everyday activities and concerns. And one of the things we began to look at is how do people use health information? You know, if they're being told, for example, that they should eat healthily, uh, they should eat well, or if they're told to exercise, what's that actually mean uh, for them? And what Liz found is that doctors like to scrawl, for example, uh, on Actually, my doctor likes to do this. When I go in to see him, he takes out my test scores and he circles a few and says good, and on a few others he says, you know, exercise more or whatever. And I have to somehow translate that into my everyday practice. And we'll chat for a couple minutes, but I only get to see him maybe 15 minutes every six months. Uh, some of these people reported seeing their doctor every, for five minutes every six months. So not a whole lot of time. Presumably this has gotten better with Obamacare, this is all free Obamacare. Uh, but it's still an issue, I think, even for someone as highly educated as me. So uh, one of the things we looked at were translating information, making it, making it meaningful and actionable in a social context. So for example, in Flint, and I'm gonna give some extreme examples because it's Flint, but I think you can also find examples probably in your lives or your parents' lives. Um, so one of the things they said was eat healthy you know, eat fresh vegetables and fruit. And that's great, except that Flint is a food desert. So they have to figure out how to get to a grocery store on the outskirts. And that's great, except that public transportation doesn't work very reliably. And in fact, if you're over uh, 50, 50, 55, which most of these people are, which is kind of elderly in this population, uh, if you stand on the street corner, you're a target. So you don't want to stand on the street corner. And so people, do workarounds, like one person has a car, another person pays for gasoline, and they go out and they do grocery shopping. But that takes a lot of work and a lot of thinking through. Uh, another thing that um, you, know, you might get is exercise. I just mentioned that for me, right? And that makes a lot of sense, except that it's really cold and icy in Flint, right? They don't really do the sidewalks very well anymore. And so you're out, you're somewhat elderly, and now you're trying to exercise on ice. Right, not a great idea. Or, again, if you go out and exercise by yourself, you're kind of a target. Uh, so what people do is they band together. They have little walking clubs when the weather's nice, and maybe they'll get a ride out to a shopping mall uh, to, uh, to uh, exercise when the weather's bad. Oh, sorry, I just, are you also taping me on that small thing too? <laughs> I feel like, uh, like some celebrity event here. <laughs> All right. See how, how steady your hand is. Um, and so uh, there's lots of things that we could look at for health information. So people don't understand their doctor's uh, instructions. A lot of times you can see these pieces of paper that people are handed uh, by their doctors. If you go to one of the clinics, you can see them kind of just blown against the fence because people kind of drop them as soon as they walk out the door. Um, I get stuff from my doctor that I don't really understand. Uh, they don't know how to put them in practice, as I just discussed, and they're really not sure how much to use them. So there's a lot of mistrust of the medical uh, community in Flint in particular, but in a lot of minority situations. And as we'll see, this is actually also true for middle class whites. Uh, you know, there are many alternative uh, uh, medical regimes that people uh, use to contest the kind of medicalized practice. So. If you don't believe me, think about the vaccine debates, um, think about natural, uh, um, so-called natural ingredients. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of common research studies that we could have done. So we could look at how doctors were more effective in explaining, um, how doctors could motivate their patients, so some of Paul's work uh, and Mark, how we can build apps to, mo uh, to motivate patients, how we can correct errors people pick up, um, 
what else do they need to know to be practicing activated patients or some sort of so you know, stuff? And those are all great. I'm not saying that they're not great, but um, we decided to, uh, and, and I should say that we began down this road. So we built um, something called FIT, uh, Flint Information Translations. Uh, I know you can't see this. Uh, it turns out that we have no running system anymore. Uh, so all we have are some old screenshots. But uh, it started off as basically YouTube for uh, health information. And um, uh, this was actually done by an undergraduate. Um, and the idea was, this is, what, I can't quite point. Um, but the doctors and stuff would be on the left and then there'd be a little bit of translation into English and then a bunch of videos they could watch to try to understand what it was that they were supposed to do. So this is very much, I would call, an information transfer app. If we just throw more information at somebody, they will understand and be able to do stuff. And this works to some extent. Uh, and you know, it would lead to a standard CSCW study and we went down that route. Uh, so, you know, study the people that needed the system, so we already did that, I mentioned that. Study some people who translate now, we did that, we looked at diabetes educators. We created, created a video, that should be collection, that helps bring people to the medical point of view. And we stopped before evaluation, because what we realized is it was only skirting the problem in a lot of ways. There were a lot of other things going on besides just a need for raw information. So there were lots of issues of trust, which I just mentioned. There were alternative viewpoints. A lot of times people had um, other groups of people feeding them information, some of which was valid and some of which was not. Uh, they didn't necessarily have the right resources to do the translations that we were thinking of. And this got us to thinking, what was the right study? And eventually, wow, so much for spell check. Uh, and two prototypes later, we started thinking, well, what are the broad categories of research questions that are missing here? What, what might be more appropriate? And the argument then became, well, maybe CSCW interpretive work needs to be expanded. Um, but where and what's an agenda? Everybody with me? Okay, um, I should say that people really like this system, so when we showed it to diabetes educators, they were really excited about it. Um, the video turned out to be really important. It turns out that not only is this a low literacy group, but actually it's a, it could be a youthful group as well, right? There are a lot of type one diabetics in their teens and 20s, and video was much better than reams of text that they were giving them now. Uh, there was a lot of interest in doing the translations to help people understand what to do, because it turns out but that, that's what diabetes educators do a lot. They, they help people translate into everyday practice as much as they can. So for example, uh, there's a very large uh, faith-based community within the African-American community in, in Flint. And so one of the things they do, one of the things that health educators do, is to make people understand that it's okay to see a doctor anyway, that they can carry these things out as well. Um, they don't have to be uh, dependent completely on faith, although they can honor their, their faith. And so it's not that people weren't doing this, but again, there were questions of, um, that was only part of the story that people were getting. Okay, so um, as I pushed against the boundaries uh, in terms of CSCW studies, um, I found, we found that symbolic interactionism had already gone through a very similar process. So, um, I should say that um, I am going to confuse everyone in this room by talking about SI, not as though it's the school of information, but as symbolic interactionism, and we'll see. Uh, you guys can do the other substitution and see if it works. I doubt that it does. But, um, and uh, symbolic interactionism is, is one micro-sociological micro -sociological theory used in CSCW. So um, overall, uh, CSCW has used a variety of uh, Microsociological theories, uh, as I'll say in a minute, the major one is actually ethnomethodology, which is not ethnography. It's a, it's a particular um, microsociological theory. Uh, symbolic interactionism is another one. It has been used in CSCW. I've used it. I'm not going to claim it's the right thing to use. All I'm going to do is claim that they've gone through a similar process uh, that CSCW, I think, needs to, to, to do. And, and I've actually found it very useful, but um, 
that's again the autobiographical part. So here's where we are right now. Uh, the little red arrow is, uh, you can see by the way why I have a day job instead of a graphics job. Uh, so uh, I pointed out that um, you know we were doing empirical work. Uh, we found that we couldn't really do it without some uh, enlarging theoretical space. And um, what I'm proposing now is go look at symbolic interactionism and see some of the theoretical moves that they've made uh, and some of the ways that they've expanded themselves. And then I'll bring it back a little bit later with the, uh, with the other era. Okay, so um, uh, one of the things I guess I should say before maybe before I start down the road of what symbolic interactionism is that um, symbolic interactionism is a micro sociological theory that's been around for roughly a hundred years at this point. And one of the things that's happened is that they've had to reinvent themselves at least two to three times at this point um, in order to stay vital. So you, there aren't a lot of theoretical schools that are just completely appropriate 100 years later, right? Lots of things change. There are new intellectual uh, findings and traditions that pop up. And so those things have to be reincorporated into a living uh, community in order to keep, keep going. And so one of the questions is what needs to happen to kind of keep CSDW, uh, at least the interpretivist part, uh, vibrant. Uh, so symbolic interactionism is also called social interactionism. It's uh, called uh, somewhat incorrectly the Chicago School of Sociology, because that's where it started. It's based in Dewey and Mead and Pierce and James. Uh, you might notice that my collegiate professor thing is, uh, is the Mead professorship. Um, and I also lived in Mead House in Chicago. Uh, so this is kind of why I, one of the reasons I find it really interesting. The, uh, I'm not gonna go into pragmatism very much. It's an interesting uh, philosophical school. Uh, they actually had something that should be near and dear to every application or computer person, uh, which is the test for truth was utility. Did it work? So something is valid, um, and then there's this question of what truth is. It's valid if it actually works in the world. And, and that was the basis for a lot of symbolic interactionism. So there's a very pragmatic, in both senses of the word, uh, viewpoint going into this. Uh, the first generation, which is what's usually called the Chicago School, started around 1910. The University of Chicago was the first sociology department in the United States. It really got going in the 20s and 30s. It was a focus on urban problems. Chicago was this amazing living laboratory at the time, right? All these people were coming in, um, all these immigrants, Slavs and Norwegians and all kinds of people uh, were trying to come into, were trying to assimilate in, into the city. Uh, it was a massive industrial place in the, at the early part of the 20th century. And one of the things that the first Chicago school was really interested in was What's going on here? What's this is a whole new way of looking at uh, what people are doing, and they invented a lot of methods that we still use, or changed them to the kinds of things that we use, uh, and they also developed a whole set of concerns, and I'll, I'll go into that in a second. Um, so the second generation, which was roughly 1945 to about 1995, so about 20 years ago. Uh, some people that you might know, and some Strauss. Uh, so if you're in CSCW, he coined the term articulation work. Also it's trajectory. Uh, articulation work is essentially coordination work. Trajectory is where things move. Uh, biographical work is the work that you do to basically do uh, what uh, Goffman called uh, impression management. But Bi uh, biographical work is the work that you do to create the, the biographies that you want. So this has been very relevant in things like health, where people uh, basically have to create a new biography once they get diagnosed with a crippling disease. Uh, but it's also true probably of all of the grad students here. You're all in the midst of doing the biographical work that you need to do to become a researcher, and all the assistant professors are doing similar work to, to, uh, to uh, become a tenured faculty member. Uh, he also coined the term social worlds, which actually was used in the first um, school as well. 
Uh, social world is a, uh, you might think of it as a language world. It's a, it's a discourse community. Um, and then one of the things that I found the most useful on Strauss's work is the idea of negotiated order. <clears throat> and I think that this um, might not be as important in sociology today because this has come to basically be standard, but uh, his idea at least was that there wasn't a de facto order in the world, that things were constantly being negotiated and renegotiated in a social world or in other settings. Um, another person you might have heard of was uh, Bloomer, who came up with the term symbolic interactionism, which by the way, does not have any cognitive meaning, although it's, it's slowly become, become that. So uh, when they were talking about symbolic interactionism, they were just talking about meaning being created by both individuals or by the individuals that are involved. It's got a little bit of a cognitive spin in the sense that we all communicate through symbols. Um, but it's, it's, it precedes the cognitive revolution uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Howard Becker's Art Worlds, which if you haven't read, I really recommend, um, he also did, uh, which was basically a study of the different social worlds that need to, have to um, be around and work in order, <clears throat> excuse me, for high art to work. So if you have high art, you need dealers, you need, uh, you need low art to, bad against, um, and other similar things. Uh, and then um, he also studied deviance. I forgot sensitizing concepts, which was uh, a Harold Blumer uh, idea again, and I'll come back to that, but the idea of sensitizing concepts is just that these are things that are likely to exist in a social setting. Uh, they're not necessarily going to exist, and Mark and Paul have uh, been talking about this uh, over the last few, uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, whenever. But the idea is that um, these are things that are likely to occur and they're things that you might look for in a, particularly in a study. Um, uh, another person is Gary Fine, who studied kitchens, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it turns out that chefs have a great deal in common with software people. Um, and then sometimes Goffman. So Goffman is sometimes seen as a second generation, sometimes as a fellow traveler. He went through Chicago at the same time. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with Goffman because of his ideas of base work and uh, social, uh, small scale social interaction. That was what he was particularly interested in. Okay, <clears throat> so some basic tenets, and I'll try to move through this relatively quickly. Uh, so the first that I've already mentioned is identity. Social meaning is constructed in social interaction, and that also means identity is constructed in social interaction. An activity occurs in social ecology. So these are ongoing uh, social processes. They're dynamic. So one of the things that fascinated for Chicago school was the idea of, of Chicago as a melting pot. So they saw the city at, in terms of ecology, you know, straight up um, school of natural resources ecologies. Um, it was a horrible metaphor. Um, it only kind of worked, uh, but it was, hey, it's 1920. And uh, that's slowly gotten refined to think about it in terms of the kinds of interactions that we all have in the whole varieties of social worlds and other kinds of collectivities that we engage in. And so um, you can only really look at things through, uh, you know, if you're going out and you're trying to understand what's going on in a social setting, you really have to look at the meanings that are constructed and understood in that social that's why I find it valuable for CSW. That's why I find it valuable for CSW. Uh, I already mentioned social worlds are collectivities with shared understandings and common vocabularies. Uh, they're obviously poured in, uh, porous and fluid. You're all members of many, many different social worlds at the same time. And that, as we'll see a little bit later, is what makes health so challenging, right? Because you're actually all, you're engaging in many, many different discourse communities that may be bringing you different kinds of some of which is useful, all of which is useful, some of which is true. Um, and the other thing that they had was structure and process weren't completely separable. Uh, that's probably only important to sociologists and other social scientists here. But what it says is that things are constantly being reconstructed. So nothing is really very permanent. The kinds of understandings that you have, the kinds of uh, understandings with other people that you have are all uh, conditional and provisional. Um, and the other thing is that there's not straight up understandings, there's not straight up norms, they're common enough. 
um, and then people negotiate kind of at the boundaries. And again, these are things that have been found to be useful in CSCW overall. Um, Ethnomethodology methodology has some similar, uh, at least at the bottom part, um, some similar uh, interest. Uh, they don't deal as well with social worlds, but they have other theoretical concerns that um, uh, they do. Um, and then um, the other major theme was that there was a focus on interactional work. So this is, sometimes I call this small W work as opposed to cap W work. Cap W work is labor, the things that we do in organizations. When you go back upstairs, the things you'll do in this organized setting. Small W work is more <laughs> like kinds of work that we do. Sometimes you can think of it as the work that makes work work. Um, so it's all of the things that we do just as just in normal everyday life um, to keep our lives going. So all the coordination work you did to get here today, and you can say, well, maybe I didn't do that much, but you know, you had a whole set of arrangements about transportation, you had a whole set of arrangements about getting food this morning. Um, Mark, I suspect, was dealing with childcare at some point, or at least made arrangements for it, many of you uh, as well. Uh, we all do work to maintain our identities, right? I had to actually prepare for today, otherwise I would be embarrassed and wouldn't really be a professor or something. They'd strip me of my, my gold braid or whatever. Um, and, and I've already mentioned the incredible work that people with medical conditions have to do uh, in order to kind of keep themselves going and to think of themselves in the ways that they want to be thought about. Uh, there's a whole range of other things. This is mostly in Strauss care work, which is the work that's involved in uh, the caregivers around a patient. Um, there's a lot of emotion work. Uh, all of us that teach know that um, you know we, we need to do a certain amount of emotion work. And there's there's whole sets of other kinds of interactional work that are really important. I'm going to come back to that because I think that's a really important thing to look at. Uh, there were some new methods in the second generation. There was something called grounded theory, which I think everybody in CSCW folks at this point, um, maybe even in social network analysis. Uh, but this was designed primarily to give some sort of structure uh, to interpret this work. Um, it's now viewed as a theory method package, so there are people who believe that grounded theory can only be used in terms of symbolic interactionism. Um, obviously not everybody agrees with that. And there's, there's many different camps to grounded theory, so if you're using or invoking the word grounded theory, you should really uh, understand a little bit about the method debates that go into that. Um, and they, they range uh, in terms of different camps between Glazer and Strauss. If you want to know more, come and find me. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I should say that I've used this a lot. Um, I won't go through these, but um, we, we've been doing this for, for a long time. <clears throat> and then, um, starting about 1990, um, a third generation comes in. <clears throat> uh, so some people you might know would be uh, Lee Starr's Invisible Work. Um, I think this is probably the incident for classification book is probably still assigned. Uh, she also talked about boundary objects and infrastructuring, which uh, has led to a lot of interesting work by Carl and others here. Um, Kathy Charmaz, who's looked at chronic care, so she has a nice book called uh, Good Day, Bad Days. Um, and then Adele Clark, and I'll come back to Sharmhouse and Clark in a few minutes. So lots of work in medicine, health, and also uh, science and technology studies. Okay, finally, I got the background done. So uh, Clark in 2005, uh, in her 2005 book called Situated Analysis, Situational Analysis, uh, argues for some updates on symbolic interactionism, kind of the second generation. And this has been echoed by Shamas, who's the other uh, influential person, uh, or the other main influence in the third generation. And it consists of three major moves. Um, and so the first is that symbolic interactionism should move towards the postmodern turn. Um, and there's a whole set of reasons for this. <laughs> But largely, it's, uh, it, it leads to much more interesting social science. Uh, so the idea was to make situations the ground of analysis, not just the focus, but actually the basis, and make assumptions that there are uh, there is something very important about the actual situation or uh, kind of the context of, of the situation. 
So nothing too surprising to people in CSCW because we've been doing this for years too. Um, but this has turned out to be a really good starting place for symbolic interaction. Uh, the other assumptions are that the analyst position is inherently limited. You obviously can't know everything. Um, and uh, she argued for looking for the differences and complexities and just instead of just the commonality. So here's a place where she really starts to move away from positivism and cursism and uh, towards something that looks more like situated interaction. Um, uh, the second move was a refocus on social worlds as places of situ situated interaction. Uh, so uh, there are some boundaries to social worlds. You can say that some things are occurring within a social world and some things are outside of any given one. Uh, but the two together means that you start looking at uh, practices. And again, these are moves that have largely been done implicitly in CSCW. Um, but again, these people are doing it more explicitly. And then the third thing, uh, which actually I find the most interesting, is to start considering non-humans. Uh, so in many ways, this is uh, an intellectual move to pick up some of Littler's work, if you're familiar with that. But it includes all kinds of materialities, including computers and software and you know, uh, geographical spaces, etc. And then also to include the ecology of actors or implicit actors. Uh, so uh, I won't read you this except just to notice that the first line is co-construction and co-constitution, uh, meaning that we are constantly enacting our uh, activity in relation to not just the situation at hand, but also the materialities at, at hand, the kinds of things that are in the world. And you know, I couldn't do this talk without you know the good people at Microsoft giving me a PowerPoint. Well, maybe I could, but that was a joke. Uh, okay, what I want to do now in the in the time that I have, at least some time for questions is to kind of march back and look at what this means for CSCW. So what I've said is, this is something that's happening inside of symbolic interactionism already. Uh, and there's a set of very important moves uh, that are being done by intellectual tradition in order to keep it alive and vital. And what I want to do is come back to CSCW and, or social computing and see what this has to say to that. This is a good time for me to pause if there are any obvious questions. Everybody's totally happy. You look like my undergrads. Okay. So better have any candy to throw at you to get you to talk. All right. Uh, so I'm going to argue the CSCW, uh, particularly the interpretivist part, should consider some parallel um, updates. And um, I'm going to propose two linked agendas. Uh, they're parallel, as I said, to SI's moves. Um, and Importantly, neither agenda actually alters CSCW's intellectual mission, uh, which I think of as to bring a certain coherence to both the social and the technical um, design spaces. Okay, so I'm gonna break these up. I unfortunately call them uh, conservative and I had a note to myself to change the radical agenda to the extended agenda, so people have objected to the word radical. I will just acknowledge that now, as that was not the greatest choice. So, um, you know, uh, Clark and Charmaz uh, argued for a move towards the centrality of interaction, uh, interactional work. This is the long history of symbolic interactionism. Um, I already mentioned some kinds of interactional work in Strauss, like articulation work or emotion work. Uh, there are two that are in Strauss, actually, in his, um, in his major uh, work that are really interesting, and they're not very well carried out, and they should be. They should be really central, I think, to CSCW. So one is machine work. He was looking at hospitals. He was thinking things the size of Park One machines or X-ray machines that were the size of a room, and so roughly kind of similar to mainframes, um, right? But we do a lot of work now and keeping our stuff up to date. I have no idea why this did certain things last night, um, but it was a different machine this morning. Um, you know, we have, I'm gonna guess that all of you have at least two 
two machines that you work with, and if you're anything like me, many, many more. Um, and there's a whole kinds of things that we could look at there. Uh, he also talked very briefly about information work. Uh, he didn't really talk about it very much. Um, uh, I shall be happy to tell you about this if you ask her. Um, but, you know, again, he was in an era where information meant, mostly meant communication channels. And so, again, we have the possibility of extending that. Uh, later, there are things uh, with STARS boundary work, I've used that. Um, and then lots of things about disclosure and care work. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to argue is that we need to uncover important new forms of interactional work. So, for some reason, CSCW has uh, used a set of microsociological theories and just stopped around 1995. And these things were never really updated. Um, there's some work in incorporating new kinds of uh, sociological theory. But in terms of ethnomethodological work or symbolic interactional work, it's just kind of stopped about 1995. So um, I've already said, what are the new forms of work? Um, how can we extend the prior sensitizing concepts? Um, there is lots of work in CSCW already doing this. So Steve Jackson, who used to be here, has, has done really nice work on repair work, uh, which is kind of combining certain forms of articulation work with machine work. Repair work is just what it sounds like. It's the work of repairing machines. Uh, uh, there's been work at UC Irvine in interactional work and informal document practices. Uh, there have been lots of studies of care and emotion work and, and bi or biographical and autobiographical work. Then our study and translation work, which I talked about at the beginning. Um, and then some later work that we did on reflection work, the work that parents particularly give in trying to understand uh, what's going on in, with their child in bone marrow transplant. Uh, the second part of the agenda is to understand how people coordinate and manage their varying social world. So as I said before, we don't live in one social world. Yes, I actually go home to something else besides the school information. There are only a, probably a few of us that don't. Um, uh, but you know, we all belong to many, many different social worlds. Some of them are out in the, in the general community, some of them are in intellectual communities, um, uh, all kinds of things. And so um, one of the questions is if activity is uh, co-constituted or co-constituent uh, with the multiple social worlds in which they occur, how, how do people actually manage this? And this is really important in health, for example. Right? So, yeah, I belong to a nice middle class social world, and I get certain information. But if I read alternative magazines or whatever, I'm getting other information from other social worlds. If I'm in Flynn, I'm getting things from people around me. I'm getting things from the medical community. I'm getting things from maybe a faith-based uh, community. And so I have to somehow manage and deal with all those places um, simultaneously and this is actually pretty hard work for people um, this is something that people do pretty much every day it's pretty hidden it's what uh, we start called invisible work but it is work that I would claim we all do and the way that people incorporate especially social um, apps uh, is going to be really bound up in the kinds of social worlds that they are engaged in and there's already some work in CSCW. I would say that this is implicit in a lot of research on scientific collaboration, um, either explicit or implicit, actually. Um, but I think more, more work could be done there. And then um, the third item is that we should be examining the non humans in the world. So there's a lot of work in machine work. Uh, users increasingly live in um, dense ecologies of machines and collectivities and social apps and I am partially digital and partially in the real world. Um, I kind of move through a very strange space at this, at this, uh, at this point in time. And uh, a lot of the kinds of applications that we might want to build or a lot of the design work we might want to look at are all bound up in these notions of ecologies rather than, there's no green pasture or whatever it is anymore, right? I can't just go design something as though I can put it in front of a user and it's completely separated from everything else. Right? It's all bound up in some ways. Um, 
Uh, Suzanne Bacher has been doing some nice work on art, artifact ecologies, or what she calls artifact ecologies. Um, and to try to understand what kinds of ecologies might have systematic effects would be really important. And then also understand how collaboration and other kinds of social interaction change with the differing ecologies. And Cliff has been starting, I think, Cliff has been starting to look at this in terms of social media. Is that right, Cliff? So again, people are edging in this direction. I don't want to claim that I'm proposing things that are completely uh, new. All right, to summarize then, so I'm going to argue that there's an agenda where we could be looking for new forms of interactional work. Um, I'm going to make a wild speculation. You heard it here first, actually second. And these kinds of interactional work are actually the glue of practices. One of the issues that we have in terms of practice theory is if everything is individual practice and is all really different, how do we build software, right? We need to come up with some level of commonality in order to build apps. And so I'm gonna argue one of the places we can focus on is in interactional work, because maybe those are kind of the gluons of the, not that I know anything about physics, but the gluons of, of um, practice. Uh, we need to, I think, look at how people manage multiple social worlds, um, and then look at these questions of evolving, especially evolving ecologies of technologies and people and collectivities, and for that matter, All right, so I already told you don't hit me for using the word radical. Um, this should probably be extended more. So these are, um, these are new ways of perceiving relationships and I think come out of some of the considerations the symbolic interactionists have looked at in terms of uh, bringing in postmodern theory. So uh, the first is uh, look at the alternatives but not to find the optimal point in the design space to actually understand what the alternatives are and look for uh, some places that might not be considered optimal but might be optimal in other, other settings. Um, so for example, it might not just be about doctors transferring information to patients or patients and clinicians interacting. But in a situation like I, I mentioned in Flint, there's lots and lots of different kinds of actors all interacting together with all kinds of different agendas, with all kinds of information, lots of information, uh, lots of things being overlaid on top of the information. Right? I can't not listen to my mother. I, um, I have to pay some attention. That's something that is really important in terms of thinking about kind of the ecology of the information. Um, and with this, kind of a new way to look for generative design spaces appears. Um, you start looking for the different rather than uh, similarities. Um, and then the second one is to analyze the non-binary. So this is um, a little bit hard to understand. Um, but things are uh, not either, uh, but both are parts of things. Um, so um, I'm, I get into lots of trouble when I say this, but I'm not fully human. Right? I'm also consists of my machines. I'm a really different person if I don't have this machine. Uh, first of all, I forget things on my calendar. I forget things I need to do. Uh, you can't contact me in the same way. The interactions I have are really different. Um, this is only part of the machinery that I have. Someone who's a diabetic needs lots of different machinery to keep going. Um, and in some sense, we're becoming what uh, has been sometimes called cyborgs. Um, that we live with our machines and our machines are part of us. And they, uh, you know, in distributed cognition theory, some of my thinking gets, uh, certainly my memory gets offloaded to, to my machines. Um, uh, I think this turns out to be really important because again, going back to the health app, um, we tend to look at things as either doctors or patients, but a lot of times we don't talk about kind of the space in between, right? So there's valuable expertise flowing in both directions. There's whole ranges of clinicians in between doctor and patient. Um, patient is a really interesting term, right? It's, it's a statement of relationship already. Um, and 
Uh, in this, uh, I think the CSDW work uh, in uh, appropriation and reappropriation is only the beginning. Um, we could think about lots of different things. Um, I'm going to coin a term called, set, which I mentioned a few weeks ago, sensitizing relations. So these are relations between things. Um, you know, doctor, patient, um, uh, scientist, software programmer. There's lots of these kind of status um, uh, relationships. Uh, that may be present in a situation, but again, may, may not be. Okay, and um, so then the question you should be asking me is, well, what's all this mean to me, uh, designer? And, uh, you know, that's kind of the pragmatic test to go way back to the pragmatist at the very beginning. Will it, will it help design? That's kind of what CSTF is about. Um, will it help maybe understanding how people use it? or places that we can design. I want to return to Flint uh, for a moment. And this is actually Flint, uh, this is FIT2. Uh, this began life as a prototype for reconcil uh, reconciliation between different uh, discrepant health viewpoints. So I know you can't read this, but um, kind of at the top, there's places for alternative medicine and uh, self-healing, self-management, uh, faith, uh, we've extended that out to some other kind of uh, positions. We've done other ones that have looked like this that are more involved with social worlds that you might be involved in. The bottom is pretty much the same. It's a set of videos, but they all relate to particular positions. And you can look for the positions in between things. Now, you'll notice in this we still have self-management, the medicalized view at the center, right? And so one question would be, well, why is the center? Um, well, part of this is because you want medical funding, that's a really great place for medicine to be. Um, but as some of it is kind of actually our set of cultural assumptions. Uh, this is a alternative um, that uh, uh, Perry gave me uh, about an hour ago. Uh, and this still has self-management at the beginning, but the idea is you can kind of go to any place in between here and see points videos about that position. So basically it's a way of seeing the different kinds of positions that people have about diabetes, the places in between things. So, um, you know, uh, this might be things like uh, um, uh, maybe a medicalized view, so something like insulin versus alternative medicines or Chinese medicines that don't uh, look at Western medicine exactly the same way. And so this is just a chance to kind of explore different points of view in the space uh, without, well, without necessarily privileging any, any particular point. Um, we're still working on this sort of interface. Okay, so I want to end there. Um, I think that uh, the things that I presented will lead to new kinds of interfaces and social collaborations. Um, we're not quite sure where this is all going. Again, what I wanted to do is give uh, a voice to some of the intellectual changes that are going on in, inside CSCW. And I don't want to claim any uh, particular uh, brilliance or necessarily even insight on the part of me. I'll let my research group claim that though. And um, you know that these are a set, I think, of intellectual moves that will enrich Field of CSCW. Okay, and if you there's a draft paper if you want to copy, come and talk to me. I have like five minutes for you guys to throw uh, bricks.
problem with empathy, I think. Um, a lot of times with former past endocrinologists, it was just assumed that I was lazy, I was not doing enough, I was just not trying to help myself. And until I got my most recent endocrinologist who went, oh, I understand, I understand the amount of work you go through, that was the only time I was able to actually really work with my doctor. Because before I was just kind of well, you should be kind of Yeah, and you know, I mean, uh, not, not to minimize the amount of uh, work that you had to do, but I think this is the future of a lot of health situations. So uh, we're all gonna live with chronic diseases for 20 or 30 years. Um, type one is just, you know, is particularly nasty one, but there are many uh, where, you, you know, you're essentially thrown on your own to, to kind of stabilize and continue your condition, and at least until there's some acute flare up. Um, and nobody really knows your body more than you do. You it's hard to predict from the outside. Um, you are in charge of uh, incorporating new kinds of machinery. Um, so as new forms of uh, pumps or monitors come into being, you have to be, or uh, you know, some patients at least are very aware of that and have to do machine work that's involved. Um, I looked at, or I've been engaged in diabetic uh, support groups and um, there's a place where there's lots of information work going on. I mean, because if nothing else, they need to, ch a lot of times, uh, especially type ones, need to check to see whether or not if they affect some change, it's going to kill them. Um, uh, this, I think, is really critical, important um, information work that goes on. And again, I think this is just the harbinger of many things. Um, I should look at bone marrow transplants, so what happens if you've had a procedure and now you've got another 30 years of, or 50 years to go? All of these things change your body. We're at the advent of uh, genetic personalized medicine, and we're all, like, all of you are going to have to deal with this. This is, I think, one reason to kind of look at these questions. It's a great setup, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm really curious about this notion of the machine work. So I think the type 1 diabetes example is a really telling one, right? Because the part of machine work is all about, you know, do the machine and do hacking or programming or using the machine or whatever, you are actually engaging with your body. So it's, a, it's at the same time bodily work and emotional work. And perhaps care work if you're a parent with a type 1 uh, diabetes child, right? Who needs this? So in that sense, um, the tour for me personally doesn't work quite as well because there does remain to a degree this sort of separation between the human and the non-human, which the machine work seems to be really challenging, right? So I'd be curious to hear what you think. Well, I think you're right, right? There's this, I mean, Latour did a very nice setup of bringing, or a very nice job of bringing the non-human in, um, but it's still kind of a network and it's unclear what the effects are. Um, and so they need to make that the same time that the symbolic interactions needed to make the move of bringing the non-human and the network of non-human actors in. Um, I think in both situations you can just see things are going in a certain direction and again to remain intellectually vibrant you have to incorporate aspects of, of all of those things. So um, that was, uh, uh, instead of my saying something about Latorian theory, what I'd rather do is point towards the extensions that need to be made in either theory to kind of deal with the new All right, people are leaving, plus I think it's actually one-on-one. Thank you.